name is Dana Fanel. Um, I am the Chicago Lawyer Center of the American Constitution Society Board of Directors and Chairs. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to Chicago 10 and to this congressional forum, holding the President accountable. Um, we're very grateful to our esteemed panelists and moderator and Congresswoman Jan Chikowski, who I have the pleasure to introduce. And I'll hand it over to Amy Garden, who will be the moderator. Um, Jan Chikowski. Um, Congresswoman Chikowski requires no introduction, but for those of you who are not aware, she was elected in 1998 to represent the 9th District of Illinois. Um, she told me immediately prior to this panel that she likes to think of herself as much as possible as a leader of the resistance. <laughs> um, I could go on. Um, she holds all of the values that ACS holds dear, um, as dear or dearer, um, and we're very grateful to have her here today. Um, Jan County has a website if you'd like to know more, so I'll cut my remarks short of that. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Let me see. I'm wondering, can we pull this out and I can scan it and also put some papers on? <laughs> Okay, is it on now? Yeah. Good. Can I see you over it? <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, first of all, let me just uh, say how honored I am to be with this uh, wonderful panel of, of experts. Um, and uh, I thank you for the introduction, and I thank the Chicago Lawyer Chapter of the American Constitution Society for inviting me here today. Um, I think we face a real potential for a constitutional crisis from uh, President Trump's Muslim ban, his attack on the judiciary, uh, violations of the emoluments clause, his meddling in the Russian investigation. These are all deeply, deeply troubling, and I could certainly go on. And actually, I will. Uh, so um, talking about, uh, about immigration, our, our courts are, have already been so important. I want to thank the lawyers and the judiciary um, to put in place important safeguards against President Trump's efforts to violate our country's core values. When the President signed the, the Muslim ban, I, like many others, went out to the airport. But I saw just this huge number of lawyers that were rushing to O'Hare, ready to help however they could. It was so impressive. Any of you here out of the airport that night? It was, it was amazing. The president withdrew the first uh, Muslim ban after it was stayed by the Ninth Circuit, and last week the Fourth Circuit affirmed the freeze on President Trump's second Muslim ban. The Fourth Circuit noted in its decision that national security, quote, is not the true reason, unquote, for this ban. Instead, it was based on, in a desire, in violation of our Constitution, to create a religious test for entry into our country. President Trump also attempted to illegally withhold funds for sanctuary cities, like the city of Chicago, to force compliance with the inhumane and cruel deportation priorities. Again, the, the court stepped in. Judge William o, uh, H. Horak in the Northern District of California issued an injunction against the enforcement of this executive order. However, the same on our country's reputation and ongoing deportation efforts remain. Um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, the attacks on, on the judges. President Trump's disregard and I really think seeming ignorance of our Constitution and political norms is very disturbing. President Trump has repeatedly attacked the judiciary, complaining about uh, rulings against him and targeting specific judges in Twitter tantrums. He dismissed U.S. District Judge James Robart, who referred a challenge to the Muslim ban. Uh, he called him a, uh, a so-called uh, judge who wrote a ridiculous, he said, ridiculous decision. And Donald Trump is certainly not the first president to be frustrated by other, the other branches of government. But at the end of the day, the president must be respectful of the separation of powers in our system of government. That assumes he knows what the separation of powers really is. Um, Amalians, who knew that that would almost become household work? Uh, President uh, Trump's assault on our Constitution and political norms actually began the moment he raised his hand 
and took that oath of, of office of violation of the emoluments clause. Um, he was violating the Constitution, the American people's trust of his unprecedented conflicts of interest. And I don't have to explain the emoluments clause to, uh, to all of you, but it is interesting that the president or any elected official can, in fact, accept emoluments, gifts, but only with the permission of the Congress. He has never come to the Congress to ask for our permission for anything. And you may be seeing further action based on, on that violation. Unlike presidents before him, President Trump refused to fully separate himself his family, from his business dealings, putting him in violation of the emoluments clause. Citizens for Responsible and ethic, uh, Ethics in Washington crew, many of you, you know what they've been doing, already filed a lawsuit uh, for his failure to abide by the emoluments clause, and you might expect uh, that there will be further lawsuits in the future. Then there's Russia and the unfolding drama. I really think that the reason... Has hey, House of Cards come on yet? Yeah. Oh, it did. Okay. I thought they kept postponing it because this drama certainly takes uh, precedence. It's like, a, 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 you know, it could be a, a Netflix story. Unfortunately, it isn't a Netflix story. It's, re, it's, uh, it's reality. Uh, his flagrant attempts to disrupt the Justice Department its investigation into possible Russian collusion with the Trump campaign administration. Some have already called it an obstruction of justice. Um, he pressured FBI Director James Comey to shut down his investigation into Russian interference, and when Comey refused to do that, of course he was fired. I think there would be some point of justice um, uh, if uh, James Comey brought down Donald Trump after, I think, bringing down, helping to bring down Hillary Clinton. Um, and of course, this comes after he fired two other individuals who are investi being investigated, um, uh, who are doing the investigation, Sally Yates and U.S. Attorney Preet uh, uh, Bahara. Uh, President Trump also asked uh, Daniel Coates, Director of National Intelligence, and Mike Rogers, Director of the National Security Agency to publicly deny the existence of any evidence of collusion with Russia during the 2016 election. Both refused to do so. I spent eight years on the Intelligence Committee. This is so uh, not just unusual and unprecedented, it's so wrong. Um, as of now, Paul Manafort, Jared Kushner, Michael Cohn, Michael Flynn are all under investigation. Who knows the next names to come? There has been a, system, a systematic effort by Donald Trump and his associates to willfully mislead the American people, undermine the Justice Department and intelligence communities, and make a mockery of the checks and balances put into the Constitution. With every passing week, it seems like another thread comes loose as this administration starts to unravel. That's what I think we are witnessing right now, is the unraveling. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, uh, has, I think it says Rosenstein, has now appointed a special counsel. That's a good thing. I know former uh, FBI Director Robert Mueller. From my time on the uh, Intelligence Committee, I think that uh, my sense is that he will conduct a fair investigation. But I continue to push, and many of us in Congress, for an independent commission to look at the Russian election hacking so that we have not only uh, a council looking at whether crimes were committed, but also a broader examination of what happened, and also recommendations on how to um, address that in the future. Um, let, let me just uh, give you the, the headlines of other things that you may want to, to, to talk about. Um, we, we know that the president has set up a commission now to look at voter fraud, which we also know is essentially non-existent. Um, and we are seeing uh, states passing all kinds of voter suppression laws. Um, that is a, a serious issue. We also see with Attorney General Jeff Sessions a really rolling back of what has been almost a consensus that we act on uh, criminal justice reform in this country. It felt like we were actually close to getting some things done, 
And now um, we see with Sessions in the lead, uh, kind of a, a, a lock them up, throw a key attitude, and we've seen it in the Congress too. In the House of Representatives, a couple of bills passed just last week that I found extremely, extremely tr troubling. Um, this was uh, on our police uh, week that the, the uh, uh, Republicans established. And so uh, a bill passed that the murder of uh, a police officer, the uh, attempted murder, and the tracking <coughs> of a police officer, that those crimes could be eligible for the death penalty. And, the, and certainly uh, additions of mandatory minimum sentences. What, what was really troubling to me that 48 Democrats supported that. The, it seems like the energy is going the other way. There was also a bill that passed that said that uh, probation officers without a warrant could arrest uh, parolees. Um, and, and so we're, in, in my view, going in absolutely the wrong, the wrong direction. But let me just say that uh, in response to the challenges we face by Democratic <coughs> colleagues and I started a democracy reform task force. I'm the, I'm the vice chair of that. Um, but the, the effort to protect our democracy extends far beyond the Congress. I want to thank all the, the, the legal teams who have been hard at work in defending our democracy at so many different levels. Uh, lawyers have stepped up like they never have before and need to continue to step up. And, and when there's been a violation, we need to, uh, as the ACLU had on their big brochure after the election, we'll see you in court. Um, so we want to do our part in the legislature. I do my part trying to organize outside the Congress. I think what's happening outside is actually more important today in shaping policy than what is happening in, on the inside. So I encourage all of you to become activists, to uh, use whatever uh, legal training you have to help us to resist the challenges we see to our democracy. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Amy Gardner, and I'm the Director of Lawyer Chapters for the American Constitution Society. Um, so thank you all for being here today. We wanted to start by thanking Congresswoman Schakowsky and her staff uh, for making today possible. Uh, we also want to thank the Chicago Kent Law School um, ACS chapter for hosting us. And also want to thank the Chicago Lawyer Chapter Board, particularly Dana, who's already heard from, and Scott Richard in the back, um, for their support of this and so, so, so many other programs. We're really fortunate to be in Chicago where you have so, so many great programs um, and opportunities to learn and get together with other lawyers uh, here in Chicago. Thanks to them. So uh, Dana's going to be passing around note cards, and uh, we'll be collecting those in a few minutes if you want to submit any questions uh, for the panel or for particular panelists. Um, I also want to invite you to get involved in the Chicago Lawyer Chapter, which you can do, first of all, you can just join the Chicago Lawyer Chapter by going to acslaw.org. Um, or you can get more involved by helping plan programs like this or other events um, and activities. And to do that, you can talk to Scott or Dana afterwards. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with ACS, we're the nation's leading organization of progressive lawyers, law students, scholars, and other judges, and policy we have over 200 chapters on just about every law school campus in major cities across the country. Um, and especially thanks to the election, this is the election, the number of chapters has grown. Um, within a couple weeks after the election, we actually got three separate emails from people in Knoxville, Tennessee, who did not know each other and all wanted to start a lawyer chapter. So if we're getting that group response in Knoxville, Tennessee, which I had to look at a map to figure out where that is, um, you, you should know that ACS is growing um, by leaps and bounds across the country. Um, I, we're based in D.C., but we have staff all over the place. I'm based in Chicago. My colleague, Megan Hollis, is also based in Chicago. I and mean, she is the director of student chapters. So now I have to redo the stuff that obviously the lawyer wrote. ACS is a 501c3 educational organization whose mission is to promote the vitality of the Constitution and the fundamental values of its practices. As a tax-exempt educational organization, we do not use our funds to finance partisan activity or intervention in an election, and do not support any statements or activities that constitute endorsements of candidates or political parties. So with that, um, what we're going to do is have each panelist talk to you for a few minutes, and then um, we'll take <coughs> questions off the note cards. So um, we're going to start with Caroline Fredrickson, and since they're all more interesting than I am, I'm just going to tell you very briefly. Uh, Caroline Fredrickson is the president of the American Constitution Society. 
After Caroline speaks, then we'll hear from Aziz Huck, who's the Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, where he focuses his um, teaching and scholarship on con law, criminal procedure, federal courts, and legislation. Then you'll hear from Stephen Schwinn, who is an assistant professor and a clinical programs professor at John Marshall. He's also on the Chicago Lawyer Chapter uh, ACS Board of Advisors. And his scholarship and research focus on con law and human rights. And then finally, you'll hear from Jeff Stone, who's the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. He's co-chair of the Chicago Lawyer Chapter Board of Advisors, and he's a member of ACS's National Board of Advisors. So that, uh, Well, thank you so much, Amy, and thanks to all of you for being here, uh, to the law school for hosting us. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure. Uh, those of you who I've met before know that I'm a native, so it's, it's great to be back home. Although my real Chicagoan friends say you grew up in Evanston, and that doesn't count. <laughs> but I'd like to think you'll welcome me uh, here uh, in the South. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, I, I did a program like this um, with your colleague, uh, Congressman Tchaikovsky, uh, Jared Huffman, uh, in, Cal in California. Uh, and on my way to that uh, event, um, uh, Donald Trump uh, fired uh, Jim Comey. Uh, and it kind of upended the event to give us kind of a lot of new topics to discuss. They were sort of new in that they were uh, different of time, but they were certainly a kind of an acceleration of what we had already been witnessing. Um, every time. Every day. So I got on the plane this morning, I turned my iPhone on to see if there was any news on Twitter, and it seems to be calm today. Um, but I did want to uh, bring you greetings from Washington. Dobre um, utra. Uh, 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 hello, basically in Russian. I was a Russian major in college. It's something that I didn't think would ever be useful to me. <laughs> Here we are. Um, um, so, you know, it, it, you can make light of it, but it is it is a very strange and troubling time um, when we are all of a sudden immersed in these issues of rule of law. Um, you know, to grappling with questions um, from how does somebody lose a security clearance? What's the process for taking that away? Why is the president exempt from the ethics requirements that otherwise apply uh, to federal officials? Um, what can Congress do to provide oversight <coughs> to an administration, especially when they're of the same party? What does a special counsel do that's different from a congressional inquiry? Um, and so, you know, I think people, uh, even in Washington, where we're sort of used to the, you know, some of these procedures going on, although never quite this way, I have to say, um, you know, are, are immersed in these kinds of questions. But I think as, as Congressman, Congresswoman Schakowsky had said, there's all sorts of things are happening under the surface or behind the scenes or just not in the spotlight that are very dangerous and damaging. Um, you know, for example, we hear a lot about how President Trump has done very little to fill the ranks of government. Um, and maybe for many of us at first that we breathe a sigh of relief. Um, <laughs> okay, that's more, you know, Steve Bannon's not running different agencies. But nonetheless, it really, uh, it, it, it shows an incredible disregard for the functions of government that goes along with underfunding uh, and not supporting their missions. In the meantime, uh, Congress has moved through the Congressional Review Act to undo an enormous number, more than any before, uh, of presidential actions uh, that were undertaken by President Obama uh, through his uh, executive authority, uh, through rulemaking. Uh, it, it, an unprecedented number of those have been repealed, and very little of that has gotten attention. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it is a testament to why an organization like the American Constitution Society is so important. Because we need to keep a bright spotlight on both of those big questions about rule of law, about separation of powers, how the framework <laughs> structured uh, uh, the checks and balances so that there would be some kind of oversight, even at a time when you have one party um, ruling uh, two branches of government. Um, so, so that brings me to um, the third branch of government, which is really one of the main areas in which um, uh, the American Constitution Society does work. Um, you know, we, the Congresswoman already mentioned um, how 
this president has sought to undermine the, the stability, the, the, uh, the independence of the judiciary by making personal attacks on judges. And of course, that, that has happened before. Um, but again, I think it, it's sort of a, over, a, been evinced by a number of uh, examples um, that just reach a higher level than we've seen before. And it started last summer, you may recall, and this happened just before our national convention, where candidate Trump attacked Judge Curiel, um, who was the judge in the Trump University case. Um, and he called him a total disgrace. And he attacked him because he, then candidate Trump accused him of, of being biased because he was of Mexican-American heritage. And then, of course, uh, Judge Robart, who was called the so-called judge. Um, and then more recently, um, and it's, it's almost comical, um, but except that there, there's a danger behind the, the statement, but when, when Attorney General Sessions described his amazement at how some judge sitting on an island in the Pacific could actually have an impact on something the president wanted to do. Um, you know, and again, it is, it's sort of funny, um, except that it describes an attitude towards the judiciary that is very dangerous. Because um, I think you all know the, the statement that, um, you know, the courts are the least dangerous branch, and Alexander Hamilton um, say, you know, because there's they have neither a purse nor sword. Well, what they've had is respect. What they've had is the power of the reputation, of a recognition that in this country, rule of law prevails. But when that starts to be undermined from the highest levels, from our president and the attorney general, our chief law enforcement officer, who both attack judges personally and attack the actual basis for their jurisdiction, I think it puts us in a very dangerous place as a country. Um, and the other piece that I think you know we need to pay particular attention to is the process by which uh, this president has announced he's going to be selecting judges. And you may know that um, unfortunately there is a very, very uh, large number of vacancies on the federal bench right now, uh, an enormous number. Um, and, and due to the fact that uh, for the past several years, the Republicans in the Senate refused to uh, allow any of President Obama's nominees to move forward. Um, and that left them um, uh, with um, uh, well over 100, almost 130 nominees uh, or, or vacancies to be filled. In contrast, um, when President Obama came into office, there were 59. Um, and so you see the impact that President Trump could really have on the federal judiciary. Um, and I, so I think we have to look very carefully at the methodology by which he selects his judges. Um, and he has announced, um, announced during the campaign and subsequently that he has a litmus test for his uh, selection, um, but also that he's outsourced it to external groups, um, to the Heritage Foundation and to the Federalist Society, and let them develop a list um, and simply uh, sent that list up to the Senate. Um, and, you know, and well, it might be nice, again, to joke that it would have been nice if President Obama had just turned that over to ACS. That is not the world that we want to live in. We certainly want to have uh, input. Um, but there should be many voices having input into who the best judges should be for this country, because we believe in an impartial and independent judiciary. Uh, and the idea that the president himself has suggested that um, he'll let external groups without any other input um, develop these lists. And that seems to be actually what's happened. Um, again, I think that's extraordinarily dangerous. And again, the courts are the least dangerous branch. They don't have sword uh, nor purse. Uh, but what they have had till now is our belief that rule of law uh, is a vital element of a democracy um, and that the courts have to be respected, uh, and their voices have to be listened to. Uh, and we're in a moment where, I, you know, I'm hoping that this is, um, uh, we can stabilize, um, that all of us on the outside, as the resistance, um, can ensure that we maintain an independent and fair judiciary. But I think that's all on us. Um, it's, it's for us to stay engaged. Um, it's for us to make sure that through various organizations, uh, such as the American Constitution Society, we, we help direct and channel 
of people's interests in protecting fundamental rights and liberties and ensuring that we have uh, a vital democracy. Um, so, you know, I hope you'll join with us. Any, any of you who aren't members of ACS, um, please join us. Um, we need you. Um, we need your help, uh, support, um, and most importantly, we need your ideas uh, and direction for how we can be more effective um, in ensuring that uh, we protect our, our great democracy and that the United States of America uh, remains a beacon on the hill, if I can quote from <laughs> President Reagan. Uh, which I don't do very often, um, <laughs> but I will today. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure, and I look forward to uh, joining with all of you in, in this important work that we have to do. Thank you. I'm going to use my remarks to say a little bit about where things stand with respect to immigration. And the, the question that I want to take up is, is, is what uh, constrains uh, immigration reform in a way that, uh, in, a, in a direction that is consistent with our values and our constitution? Is it the constitution itself? Is it the courts? Or is it, is it laws? And I, I want to suggest that, that laws, and in particular statutes that Congress passes, are central to the, uh, the, the forms or the pressures that are being imposed upon uh, immigration and immigration enforcement right now. And I think we see this in three different forums, three different uh, controversies that are unfolding in the immigration context, uh, two of which uh, uh, Representative Schakowsky mentioned. And what I want to do is to step through these three uh, controversies and, and, and explain why the law matters and in particular, why the law matters, why statutes matter perhaps more than the Constitution. The first of these controversies is the debate over sanctuary cities. In an executive order uh, uh, dated January 25th, the president uh, uh, directed that uh, a class of jurisdictions that he labeled sanctuary cities would be denied all federal funds. All federal funds. And uh, if they declined to cooperate with a new federal, new national law enforcement priority. The city of San Francisco or the county of Santa Clara took the president to court in relation to that executive order. And Representative Schakowsky mentioned the uh, district court decision issued by Judge Warren of the Northern District of California. Uh, staying and joining the application of the January 25th executive order nationwide. Now, the core of that judicial decision is a set of constitutional rules. Judge Ora finds that the executive order exceeds the president's authority under the, uh, 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 the available statutes uh, uh, that uh, allow for uh, spending to localities and states to be conditioned. He finds that the order would be an impermissible form of commandeering, and he identifies federalism problems with the order. But the, the and, and so one takeaway one might have from Judge Oreck's decision is that here's an example of the Constitution checking the president. But if one scrapes back a little bit uh, from the surface, down from the surface of Judge Oreck's opinion, one sees that by and large, his constitutional holdings depend upon the, uh, the substance of federal statutes. Principally, there, there are federal statutes that condition the availability of federal funds to states and municipalities on compliance with certain conditions. And depending upon how those statutes are written, depending upon how different statutes, are, uh, appropriation statutes are bundled together, the president has more or less authority with respect to the availability of the funding as a, lab, as a point of leverage with respect to uh, states and municipalities. Uh, and, and so it is, it is really a function of the precise calibration of statutory conditions on federal fundings to, to cities like Chicago, to cities like San Francisco, that determines the scope of presidential authority. And there's no reason to think that the, the that scope of authority is going to remain unchanged. And, and, and while it is true that there are certain things that the Constitution prohibits even Congress from doing with respect to federal funds, 
those constraints are, are uh, at least hazy as a doctrinal matter, and it's not clear that they would constrain necessarily the president from uh, pursuing the same information related to enforcement ends that he, uh, he's already said that he's going to pursue. We see the same dynamic in the travel ban litigation. So again, as, as Representative Tchaikovsky mentioned, the Fourth Circuit, sitting in bond, recently invalidated Section 2C of the not 6th executive order that imposed a ban on six countries nationals from entering uh, for a 90-day period. The majority ruling in the Fourth Circuit by Chief Judge Gregory is based upon a finding that the executive order pursues uh, an improper purpose. It, it pursues a, a purpose of discriminating against a discrete group on the basis of their religious identity. The thing to notice about the establishment clause holding is how easy it would be for a halfway competent administration to circumvent. <laughs> it is just not that hard to run an interagency process that results in a immigration order that targets certain groups or certain nationalities in ways that has predictable disparate impact on certain religious groups. That the White House was palpably unable to run such a process and indeed initiated a process that resulted in the Department of Homeland Security's own intelligence analysis unit leaking <laughs> its own uh, analysis that showed the absence of evidence is a testament to managerial incompetence. <laughs> it's not a testament to the limits of presidential authority. More telling is the fact that there is a concurring opinion to the Fourth Circuit's uh, majority ruling. Uh, a, a concurring opinion by Judge Barbara keenan Milano that I think warrants a lot more attention than it, it, it's received in the press. <coughs> What Judge Milano points out is that the statute that the president purports to act under requires a finding that those persons, those aliens or group of aliens who are subject to a bar under the order, in fact represent a danger to national security. The order that the president released makes no such finding. It contains a set of boilerplate with respect to the nations that these come, that, that, that aliens are, are from which aliens are banned. But it says nothing about the actual people who are banned under the order. Indeed, the order says that the justification for a temporary ban is administrative. It's to allow an interagency process of review to occur. Right? By the way, the 90 days that would be required for that interagency process have now elapsed. <laughs> one, one query is whether uh, the fact of that elapsing will make any difference to the agent to, to the administration's demand for the order. Judge Milano's holding, I think, or Judge Milano's uh, identification of the limits that the statute imposes, I think is, is, is far more durable than the finding of uh, uh, impermissible intent that the majority is uh, ruling holds on. But Judge Milano's ruling rests upon a federal statute. It does not rest upon the Constitution. One final thought. At the periphery of our vision, as a nation, is the fact that the way in which immigration enforcement is happening on the ground is dramatically changing. The number of individuals being arrested by ICE in the country has gone dramatically up. The level of fear <coughs> that non-citizens who are undocumented feel because of the elimination of enforcement priorities on the part of ICE is dramatically spiked. The way in which people are treated at the border, whether or not they are citizens, depending upon their perceived ethnicity and religion, depending upon whether they're carrying a device that the CBP agents would like to examine, has changed dramatically. Right? The number of device searches, for example, has increased by an order of magnitude from uh, this time last year. The number of visas from Muslim, given to people from Muslim-majority countries is down 20% from this time last year. All of those dispersed 
changes in the manner of enforcement are exceedingly hard to get at through litigation that focuses upon intent or focuses upon constitutionality. The constitutional rules, in, in, in particular with respect to the uncovering of illicit intent, are extremely weak. Rather, the levers of the instruments that can be used to, to, to address those diffuse problems lie, I think, in the first instance with Congress. Right? And Congress's ability to restrict and to channel the manners of the immigration enforcement that we see on the ground. So I, I, I would suggest that even though we have seen in the courts what I would view as normative victories for constitutionalism and the rule of law, don't expect that those victories can rest solely upon the Constitution if they're going to be durable. The law, the statutes, the regulations matter a great deal. And one needs to pay attention to what's going on at the sub-constitutional level, therefore, not just the big ticket establishment laws or uh, First Amendment. Have questions ready? Dana or Scott will be glad to take those from you. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Dana and Scott for putting together this panel. Outstanding work. Very good panel. Really important topics, obviously. I had told Scott that I'd talk a little bit about the Russian investigation, and I'm happy to do that if we want to talk about it. I'm sure anybody is happy to do that if we want to talk about it in the QA. But I think I'm going to take my conversation in a little bit different direction to an area that we haven't heard about yet. And I want to start by saying I was, um, I was at a symposium last week on the separation of powers, comparative separation of powers, hosted by the University of Milan in Italy. I was one of the only Americans there. And so all the Europeans kind of pounced on me and they asked, what is going on with the Trump administration? What's their theory of separation of powers? And my guess was, yeah, right? That was kind of my reaction. I said, I really don't know. It's not clear to me what they're doing. Being charitable, they may be viewing every kind of interaction with Congress or the public or the courts as a kind of one-off negotiation of what they're doing is overshooting in a kind of crass, sort of opening move in a negotiation that one might do in, say, a real estate negotiation. I don't really know what they're doing. But it strikes me that one thing that they might be doing is trying to move the goalposts in terms of constitutional discourse a little bit. What it seems that they're trying to do is in one-off kind of negotiations in these different policies, many of which we've heard about, is to take a position that's so far outside of the constitutional norms that we're accustomed to that they're actually going to pull us in that direction, right? So even if they lose, ultimately, with their strong position, they'll have pulled the country in the direction of their position. There's a problem with this. When they establish their opening move, the administration seems to be doing it in an apparently nonsensical kind of way. I mean, the administration really seems to be flailing. I've got a very good example of that I'll share with you in a second. But I want to contrast that with a different administration that seems to be adopting a similar kind of opening position in trying to change the Constitution. We all remember the Bush administration, right? The Bush administration, after the attacks on 9-11, time and time again took constitutional positions that were outside of the boundaries of constitutional norms in an effort to pull the country in that direction, even if they didn't win their ultimate position. What we saw in the Bush administration is that the courts pushed back in some important ways, Congress pushed back in some important ways, but the courts in Congress didn't push back in other important ways. The point is, we had a reasonable constitutional dialogue about the limits of executive authority and the separation of powers. The problem with the Trump administration's opening position in this sort of nonsensical, sort of flailing way is that not only are their positions extreme, but they don't make any sense. It's really hard for us to oppose them and to have a reasonable constitutional dialogue about the extent of executive authority and separation of powers, given what appear to be, again, sort of nonsensical positions on the part of the executive. 
The one example of this that I think may be better than any others, and we haven't heard about yet, is the two-for-one executive order that President Trump issued earlier this year. You might remember the two-for-one executive order said that any administrative agency, when they move to adopt a new regulation, has to withdraw two regulations so that the net cost is no greater than zero. Right, so there are two components of it. It's the two for one, you have to withdraw two regulations for the adoption of one, but the net cost has to be no greater than zero. This is a very strange way to regulate, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't appear to be tethered to any sort of statute. It's a, it just it's kind of a free floating thing out there that says two for one if you're in an, in an administration. It doesn't even give you any even more guidance about which two for which one do they have to be related, anything like that. And so the question is, well, how do you respond to that kind of thing? What do you do, right? Well, it turns out Public Citizen and the NRD, uh, NRDC filed suit against the Trump administration opposing the two-for-one regulation EO in uh, federal district court in the District of Columbia. That suit is now pending. And they challenged the regulation as arbitrary and capricious under the Administrative Procedures Act and as a violation of the president's take care responsibility under Article II of the Constitution. Now, we'll see where that suit goes. I don't know. But um, a group of constitutional uh, constitutional scholars have recently filed an amicus brief in that suit, making some interesting historical arguments about the administrative state and why a two-for-one executive order really violates constitutional norms, kind of, again, in the extreme, in a way that's really sort of squishy and hard to get our arms around so that we can reasonably oppose it. The problem is both substantive and procedural. The substantive problem is exactly what I described. The substantive problem is the administration's adopting these crazy positions. We don't really know how to respond to them, right? Within normal, ordinary constitutional discourse. The procedural problem is a standing problem. Who has standing to sue the administration when it adopts a two-for-one executive order? and it hasn't yet implemented it, right? So Public Citizen and the NRDC have their theory of standing and they've put it in the complaint. But one thing that I think might be, I'm not quite sure yet how to feel about this, but one thing that I think we're seeing coming out of these Trump administration executive orders is that the federal courts have recognized them as kind of so off the wall crazy that they've accepted theories of standing that many dispute, right? Why should cities have standing to dispute the travel ban, for example, before it's even enforced? Or why should sanctuary cities or sanctuary states have standing to challenge the uh, sanctuary city's executive order before it's even enforced? Now, those are good theories of standing, in my view, that the parties have put forward to the courts. But what's exciting to me about it is that the courts have accepted them, right? And so one backlash that we might be seeing against these crazy positions that the Trump administration has been taking is that the federal courts seem to be accepting theories of standing that some would consider kind of on the edge. Um, that's a good sign. So if the courts can start to push back, I, I think that's good. But I do come around to, to where Aziz uh, commented, so much of this is subconstitutional, right? If we go back to the two for one executive order, this is all about Congress's authority to uh, legislate and tell the executive how they're going to regulate. And then when the Trump administration tries to pull back two regulations for one that an administrative agency adopts, that we can make a good argument that that's a violation of the Take Care Clause because it's against what Congress is saying. I think I'll talk a little bit about um, the Senate and the judiciary, and particularly the Supreme Court. Um, and th the day after the election, um, I had been scheduled to and did give a talk to the ACS chapter at Notre Dame. And the talk was about this very subject. Uh, and I expected, since I assumed the day before, that the outcome of the election would be different from what turned out, uh, to give a very upbeat uh, and inspiring talk about how fortunate they were to be coming out of law school at the time, when we would have a Justice Garland replacing a Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court, 
when the three most senior justices, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kennedy, who would likely leave over the next four years, would be replaced by President Clinton, uh, and that they would be in a new era of constitutional law uh, that would enable the court and enable the society to move to new places. Um, unfortunately, of course, when I uh, got there, I had to say, this is what I was hoping to tell you, <laughs> and now I have to tell you something which is really pretty dire. Um, so what I want to do is say a little bit about, about that problem that we now face, and I think it's the product of a couple of factors. First thing to keep in mind is we should not forget how unbelievably conservative the Supreme Court has become over the years. 13 of the last 17 justices have been appointed by Republican presidents. Um, and uh, given the, the current makeup of the court, which more or less, I believe, mirrors what it was in the recent past, with Gorsuch replacing Scalia, um, is the most conservative Supreme Court in you know, at least 70 or 80 years, uh, and maybe well beyond that. Uh, and we've come to sort of take it kind of for granted because we've gotten used to it. Uh, but this is a Supreme Court, it's important to remember, that it's held unconstitutional, not, this is not judicial restraint, it's held unconstitutional, um, affirmative action, uh, gun regulations, campaign finance reform, the Voting Rights Act, uh, on and on and on, uh, in ways that uh, clearly reflect a strong ideological conservative bent in terms of what they've imparted into the Constitution, uh, and it's only going to get worse. Um, so one question about this is, is how this happened, and, and here I want to put the Senate into play, um, because one of the realities is the manipulation of the, uh, of the filibuster process um, is, I think, one of the real tragedies of the Senate's history. Um, from 1952 until 2013, roughly 61 years, um, this, the filibuster was used at a total of 90 occasions um, to uh, interfere with the president's ability to make a uh, federal appointment. Um, 72 of those 90 occurred in the four years of the first term of President Obama's presidency. Um, that is, in that four-year period, 78% of all of the filibusters in the 60-year period occurred. Um, that was completely, obviously, unprecedented on principle um, and had a dramatic impact upon the president's ability to make appointments and particularly uh, to the judiciary. Um, when the Democrats finally, correctly, in 2013, eliminated the filibuster from presidential appointments other than the Supreme Court, um, they did so not because the filibuster had proved historically to be a bad idea in this context, but because the Republicans had completely abused this device uh, in a way that was never been done before. It was unconscionable. And they were right at that point to say, this is the device that's meant to be a safeguard, which is now being used to simply block appointments because the minority of the Senate doesn't like the president's nominees. Um, and they didn't extend the filibuster to Supreme Court because there had been no history of abuse of the filibuster with respect to Supreme Court nominees. And they could have done that. It was in their interest to do that because if Obama did have another nominee, the Republicans could have filibustered, but the Democrats actually, in a principled way, set that aside and said, we're not going to eliminate the filibuster for, for Supreme Court nominees. So then we have, of course, the nomination of Merrick Garland after Justice Scalia's um, passing. And in nominating Garland, uh, obviously Obama appointed someone who was a good deal more moderate than his two prior nominees, uh, Kagan and Sotomayor, who were both themselves relatively moderate liberals, uh, but Garland was clearly much more so. Also, a nominee who is older than any person who's been nominated to the Supreme Court um, in 60 years, with the exception of Justice Powell, who's the same age. And he did this in order to basically find a compromise and to offer someone who the Republicans could comfortably live with. Um, but instead of accepting that, uh, McConnell and his Senate cronies basically came up with this idiotic idea that was completely ahistorical that said the president should not be allowed to appoint Supreme Court justices in the final year of their term. Thirteen prior presidents had, in fact, done that, including such insignificant characters as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan. Um, no, no, this has never happened before. This is unprecedented. Um, and the reason they did this was obviously in the hope that a Republican would be elected president in 2016, 
and that uh, he would have the opportunity to replace Scalia with another uh, very conservative justice. Um, and in fact, it turned out that way. And then, of course, when the Democrats uh, indicated they might filibuster Gorsuch's nomination, not because Gorsuch himself was necessarily unqualified or otherwise an inappropriate nominee, but because of the way they'd gotten to that point. Um, the Republicans then, of course, got rid of the filibuster when it came to Supreme Court nominees without batting an eye. Um, and so we've gotten to this point in a way that, it, when we look at it historically, is really pretty um, depressing and on principle. Uh, and, and part of what's depressing about it is the failure of the Obama administration and the failure of the media to make an issue of this the way they should have. And I believe they didn't, mainly because they figured Clinton was going to win anyway, so it wasn't really worth spending any capital on. But I think that was a terrible mistake. And we now face a situation where um, we, the three oldest justices on the court, uh, Kennedy, Ginsburg, and Breyer, um, at least one of them, I would guess, is likely to step down in the next uh, couple of years, either for reasons of health or otherwise. There's already rumors about Kennedy to that effect. Um, if and when that happens, uh, Trump will get to nominate another Alito Gorsuch type of justice. Um, there will be no way of stopping that at all. And we will then have by far the most conservative Supreme Court, um, as far as I'm concerned, in, in history. Um, the swing justice will no longer be Anthony Kennedy, but John Roberts. John Roberts is thought to be a moderate because he cast one moderate vote in his entire career so far <laughs> on highly ideological cases. Um, and a lot of important precedents will be at stake. And the one I want to mention, uh, which I think is most uh, concerning, is Roe v. Wade. Um, I, I do believe that if um, Trump gets another nominee, that that new five-member majority will overrule Roe v. Wade. Um, and I think that the absence of a really strong movement today about abortion is a terrible absence in our polity. Um, there was a strong political movement in the late 60s and early 70s about uh, women's right to choose. Uh, that made a huge difference, and it made a huge difference on the Supreme Court. I was there as a law clerk to Justice Brennan that year. And there's no doubt that the views of the justices were informed by the extent to which there was this powerful, strong, not only movement for the right, but also an understanding of what the world was like when there was no such right, and how demeaning and dangerous that was for women. Um, that has largely disappeared in American politics. It's all come from the other side ever since then. For the moral majority, yes, it has. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It has. And um, I think it is imperative that if we want to have any hope of keeping Roe v. Wade, that a really um, strong and powerful pro-choice movement, um, again, come to the fore. And right now, I think that is not the case, and we can disagree on this. Um, but I don't think this is an issue that most Americans think of as terribly critical. And I think that's potentially disastrous. We can disagree. <laughs> Questions that you all have submitted. I tried to just combine them based on topic, um, not on content or anything else. But first, do you want to? You had to go first, so that means you didn't get to talk about it. Well, if I actually, if I could just uh, comment on that, I've been an organizer most of my life um, before Congress, and I think of myself still as such. I've never seen such a mobilization, um, and it began in its intensity the day after the inauguration with the Women's March. And while it was multi-issue, without a doubt, um, I saw more um, beautiful designs of lady parts uh, <laughs> on, on, on slides. Um, and and the, the other reason why, I, I, mean, I certainly agree that we need uh, uh, an, an incredibly intense uh, mobilization around women's reproductive health or around abortion, around Roe v. Wade. Um, I am seeing more young women, women of color, really fierce, who, among other things, got me and Barbara Lee um, in the Congress to introduce a bill that would um, repeal the Hyde Amendment. This is the amendment that says that no federal funds. 
a kind of a litany that we've been saying all the time, oh, don't worry, there's no federal funds going. We have 85 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives now, which is not totally insignificant. Um, and I, I just think that women, there will be such an incredible fierce, it'll probably, um, I mean, it's growing now, but when there's a nominee to the court, I don't, women are not going to go back. And I think you will see an outpouring like we've never seen before. Women remember before Roe, I mean, I have a button that says, uh, Roe v. Wade wasn't the beginning of women having abortions, it was the end of women dying from abortions. And I really think that, uh, I see a lot of it now, but you, you will see more. I, I think what's missing is exactly this last point, which is that, that there are women, women's movement saying we're in favor of choice, we're in favor of abortion. What's missing are the, the kind of powerful stories that change public opinion and change the, the, the ju justice's opinion in Rome about what, what it is like in a world in which abortion is illegal. That's what needs to come to the fore. That needs to be, that movies need to be made about this, uh, TV shows need to be made about this, people need to tell their stories. It's become largely forgotten. And I think that's a, a critical part of what, what, what motivated people before and needs to motivate them now. To talk about, I'm all in favor of choice, that's great. But what really affects people is understanding what it's like to be blindfolded and picked up in an alley and, and driven to some place by people you don't know and have them do this abortion and drop you off in another alley and have 200 women a year die from this. And that's what needs to be told. I accept that. Sure. Oh, um, let's go to a lighter topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a topic that it actually is the number one topic out of your questions. Um, a very insignificant issue, um, impeachment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all worded differently, but a couple of different people wanted to know about impeachment and what the timeline would be and what it would look like, if this is possible, and what would this mean? What do we need to do? <laughs> uh, well, I'll speak very briefly uh, because I acknowledge that I'm on a panel of, of constitutional experts and a member of Congress. So um, my place is really, uh, I think, you know, just to say, having having um, been asked this question many a time, uh, I think, you know, the most important element is to understand two things. One is um, impeachment is a political process. It's not a legal process, strictly. Um, and therefore, um, the only way a president gets impeached is because Congress decides that that's the right thing to do. And Congress is now in the hands of the Republicans. So until they think it's the right thing to do, it's not going to happen. Which doesn't mean that all of the all of the variety of, of uh, ethical violations, potential legal violations, um, the dangers that are raised to our national security by breaches of intelligence, uh, uh, by uh, providing confidential intelligence to uh, <coughs> and potentially enemy governments. All of those issues need to be explored. We need appropriate oversight. I think where our role comes in as an engaged uh, electorate, um, as people um, who are active in protecting fundamental rights and, and liberties, is to continue to work to make sure that that oversight happens through whatever pressure we can put on to give support to good members of Congress and to put pressure on bad members of Congress um, to litigate, to do public education, to organize, to advocate, to be out there. And I think <coughs> impeachment, that may happen, but that's not, I think, what should be our first concern. Our first concern should be rule of law in this country and making sure that we hold our government accountable. If I, if I could just comment, you know, um, Mike Pence has set up a <coughs> new uh, political action committee I don't know what that means in terms of uh, what they think uh, potentially could could happen, and I've heard there's some um, people in uh, government that are not Democrats looking at the 25th Amendment. So there, there are, and I don't think there's any question really that impeachable offenses have been um, committed. But um, uh, Caroline is absolutely right. This is a, a political a, a political process. I am not really in favor of pushing the idea or the word of impeachment. Some of my colleagues uh, are. But to support this process that is, as I said, I think, starting an unraveling of this administration. The question is, 
when, and not if, I think when there is a tipping point. When will there be a tipping point? And there are a couple things, one very political. I think, for example, I think if we win this special election in Georgia, that that would begin to scare the, the pants off some of my colleagues who have stuck with the administration and feeling that they may have to uh, step out on their own now and separate themselves. Um, and as more and more embarrassing things, the, the, one, the one element of this administration, first of all, it's not leaks. I mean, it is a torrent uh, <laughs> coming out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the White House. Um, so we're finding out things more and more. There's obviously people within the administration who are willing to, you know, let things out. And two, that Donald Trump himself is willing to throw the people, we haven't seen the family yet, but the people closest to him under the bus. So there's not a lot of uh, traction for people who stand up and, yeah, I'm the president, and we'll see how long Spicer who you know, was just absolutely a praise of this foreign trip, and it was historical. He used it six times. It was historic, the accomplishments of his, uh, you know, he may be fired. Um, the, the president, the vice president, has been undercut time and again by the, the president, um, you know, saying that uh, he would, the rec there was a recommendation to fire Comey, and it turns out the president gets up and says on television, oh, that was all my idea. <laughs> so they, they, look, they look foolish. So um, I, I really do think there will be a tipping point, and it's not necessarily helpful to keep talking about impeachment. The impeachment argument against, against impeachment goes this way. They couldn't win the election fair and square, I won. So they're going to figure out the device right. to, to get rid of me. This is all about this conspiracy. Can I, can I just add two things, which I think largely build on Caroline's uh, uh, point? The, the first is that it's not just impeachment that is political. It is the popular response to impeachment that is political. Impeachment undermines the party that pushes for impeachment, in particular if it is a partisan process. The second point I think to make, if one looks at the polling data from Montana and elsewhere, one sees that the raft of things that we have been talking about, including the, the Russia scandal, uh, including the, the, uh, the physical assault by uh, soon to be Representative Shukowski's colleague, Mr. Gianforte, on uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Guardian reporter do not change people's preferences or their intentions to vote with respect to uh, particular candidates, either Gianforte or President Trump. No, let me just say can I, that actually a number of people called the election board to see if they could change their vote after the assault. Two thirds had already voted. Although Gianforte got $100,000 in donations in the 24 hours after the assault. So, the, the, uh, to my mind, there is a, a, a large question as to why there are so many of our colleagues, peers, neighbors, who do not believe in the value of civility, who do not believe in the idea of living with people of different races, colors, ethnicities, faiths. Who, who are committed to a very, very different style of politics, a very, very different way of coexisting, or not coexisting, than all of the assumptions and the, 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 the discussion and the sort of is predicated upon. And until one grapples with that, until, until one figures out how to talk to those people, to talk about impeachment to me seems to be um, not just politically wise, but politically suicidal. I just want to add one thing to Aziz's point, which I think is absolutely on target. Um, to say, though, that the, the ongoing conversation that has been had about um, the, um, the failings of this president to live up to his promises in a variety of areas um, has started to have an impact. So I think that the, the, the coupling of this strong and important 
oversight uh, on rule of law issues with the aggressive uh, discussion of policy matters that affect people where they live, like healthcare, um, is actually starting to have an impact. Um, and there was a, a, a poll that I read, was either in the Washington Post or the New York Times, and that's what I wrote today. Um, of Kaiser were looking at independent voters um, who had supported Donald Trump and seeing a very strong erosion uh, in their support because of these you know, sort of failures to produce um, uh, meaningful um, improvements in their well-being. Um, they tend to be sort of lower income um, white folks and um, they're not seeing it come through for them. So I think you know this is all part of that same discussion. You know, it is politics is both congressional um, and popular. Um, and all of those things come together wherever they lead us, hopefully it'll be to a better place. I think there's another reason to be cautious about impeachment. Donald Trump has managed to do some serious damage, no doubt, but relative to the damage that he might have done, it's relatively little. And, and, and uh, he's essentially tied himself up, right? We talked about the litigation over the executive orders, for example, where he's just made mistake after mistake after mistake in almost what seems to be an almost deliberate effort to undermine his own agenda. If we have a President Pence, we'll have somebody who is competent and conservative. And I think that that's much more frightening in some ways. Yeah. Let, me just, let me just say, I, I, think it, I think were that to, to happen, that the administration will have been so undermined that and it'll be closer to the next presidential election that there is no chance that a Pence could get reelected. Um, but I, I don't think that. Uh, um, and, 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 and let's wait. Pence was the transition chair. And I'm not so sure that this whole Russian entanglement won't, uh, won't bring him to the forefront, too. So, so for our next question, um, one person asks. Uh, how do we stay engaged when the rhetoric is so divisive and people seem to believe whatever source they receive their information from without checking credibility? This is evidently written by someone who sees my father's Facebook post. <laughs> well, let me just say, I have not seen that. I just want to go back to what I said earlier. That I have never seen such a mobilization. People wanting, I mean, I go to the jewel and people come up to me, what can I do? Just tell me, what can I do? And there are things, a lot of things that, that people can do. I even got some people from Evanston that are going to be going down to uh, to Georgia to volunteer in that in that election. Um, people are doing um, phone banks. They're getting more involved in their local elections, which have turned out to be very important. For example, on whether or not communities should opt out of the minimum wage ordinance from the uh, the, the county. Uh, the, the level of engagement is just uh, remarkable to me. You set up space for, you know, my, as an organizer, you set up a smaller room, then you think, you know, people are going to come, and, and you make calls, and then you make recalls. And now, you know, you set up a room for 100, and 400 people show up. So I don't, I'm not feeling that. I'm feeling more that people are just looking for what to do. A new group every day. We've got uh, Indivisible, uh, that organization that started online. Um, now they're hiring staff. They've got, um, I don't know, 30,000 individual chapters, <laughs> something like that, all over the country. It's remarkable. So yeah, I, I'd have to pick up on that just to say that, you know, as you mentioned, Amy, um, Knoxville is not our only new chapter. Um, we've, we've had That's why I have the bags under my eyes. Uh, yes, exactly. So Amy has been working very hard, as has Megan, in capturing all the energy of the people who are coming to ACS, both to join, to start new chapters, but also because they want to participate in something. So we're connecting them with some of these new groups that are engaged in litigation. We're connecting them with research projects that need to be done. Um, we're we're um, finding people in these litigating groups or on the Hill or in uh, other uh, legislators who need assistance in thinking through public policy issues. So there's so many ways to connect, and I think running for office is a really important one. We're also um, really interested in encouraging people in the ACS network to think about le the legal offices. I think progressives often consider somehow inappropriate to run for DA or think about AG or run for a judgeship. 
Um, but we really need good people in those positions because if you really want to have fair and impartial justice, you need to have people who understand the Constitution and values. Um, and so I think that's a really important piece of this is for us as progressives not to turn away from those positions as prosecutors potentially because you know you need a good defense and you need a good prosecution to make a good system of justice. So I encourage people to think about that. Well, let me just say one other thing. You know, my new colleague may have gotten $100,000 overnight, but the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, I mean, the, the donations that are going to and the involvement in your organizations has exponentially increased. So if you don't want to necessarily run for office, say you have an hour today, what can you do that actually makes a difference? I, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that all the lawyers in this room know um, or are acquainted with uh, five, ten people who are undocumented. They're the people who you interact with at the grocery store, perhaps. People who are maybe your doorman uh, or your doorman's relatives. And you can take a moment and ask them, do, do, do any of you uh, need help with, for example, preparing affidavits that you might need if uh, your or a family member is deported? And there's a question of what happens to the children, right? There are lots of things that one can do that are of that kind, that are immediately of assistance to people who don't have what it means to the system. And I'd like to say one thing that we're um, sort of encouraging our members to do is to think about your friends who are more conservative um, and start talking to them about, you know, if there were more attacks on judges, would you be interested in speaking out as a joint liberal and conservative to sort of defend the judiciary and start building those bridges. Um, I think that's a really important, important uh, thing to do, as well as think about your friends who are um, on the liberal side who aren't members of ACS yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are a group of students at the Chicago Law School who um, created this program, which is really interesting. The, the platform, uh, the idea of it is that basically you sign up for it, um, it will track what you read online, and it will send you the flip side. Um, the kind of things you read, and the idea is to is is, is to give people a, a much better sense of, of the other perspective, um, and that's what we need in part right now on both sides. Is what we need right now, uh, because people have so much fall into their own bubbles um, that uh, they don't understand where the other side's coming from. So devices like that, ideas like that, I think are really important to the society and to the democracy. One of the things I do at John Marshall's co-director of Human Rights Clinic, and um, exciting phenomenon after the election, we got a number of new clients, but we also got a number of new volunteer attorneys and a lot of student interest in the clinic. Um, one of the things that we do is represent Syrians uh, in Chicago and indeed around the country in their asylum claims and had a lot of new uh, volunteer pro bono attorney interest in working with us in those cases among some of the other human rights work that we do in opposition to things that the Trump administration is, is trying to do. And so just a plug, if you're looking for volunteer opportunities, talk to me. And since they gave me a microphone, I feel like I should say this. Um, ACS actually has expanded to the point where we brought somebody on who one, one part of her job is um, connecting attorneys with pro bono opportunities. And so if you need volunteers for things, let us know. And Ashley's happy to help you find people. If you find yourself um, interested in some of these projects, Ash is happy to help uh, connect you with things. That a lot of them are research projects that you can do from wherever you are, and other times that she may know of something in Chicago specifically um, that's looking for more help. And one thing that we do across the country is Constitution in the Classroom, where attorneys will go and teach an hour class at your know, middle school, high school, whatever. Um, and we have all these different curricula that have been organized on different parts of the Constitution. So some people will go to the same class a few times, and other times people will just go into one class once. Um, and it's all online. We mail you a box of constitutions. You email a teacher that you know or whatever will help you find a school. Yes, and there you go. You go do that. And this year, actually, something that Megan and I came up with um, in like 20 minutes once, and it turned out really well, was uh, it's called Love Our Constitution. And the idea was we're encouraging people to talk to their friends and neighbors about the Constitution. So not just to high school and elementary school kids. And some folks in Chicago, um, one, two, uh, two people did work in the basement of a yarn shop. Um, other people went and did it with their kids' Boy Scout troops. Uh, people did it at synagogues and churches. So 
Um, that's something too, if you're not so sure you want to hang out with uh, high school kids or um, smaller kids, you can uh, do it with your friends and neighbors. That's another program that's super easy. You let us know you want to do it, we value the constitutions to help you out. So those are also things to do. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, some of these are so depressing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, one criticism I hear of the court's rulings, especially on the travel ban, generally but not entirely from the right, is that the courts are overstepping in ways that will be distorting of separation of powers and presidential authority for a long time to come. Similar critiques apply to leaks from national security personnel. This is debatable, of course, but assuming there is in fact some overreach, what is your response? I, I think the claim that there is overreach in the court's rulings on the travel ban or, or otherwise uh, is based upon an assumption that the president should have a, a, a broad scope of discretion for taking actions in relation to national security or foreign policy. Um, this is an argument, the argument for deference, uh, is one that, that some of our colleagues have made. Uh, and it's an argument that, that in part is parasitic on the constitutional text but really is a claim about the comparative institutional competence of the executive branch. It's a claim that the executive branch has more information, we can act better, and we don't need to worry about its motives because the president has essentially good motives because he or she is looking forward to the next election and is motivated to uh, protect the nation as a consequence. Now, what, what I find both amusing and uh, troubling is that when confronted with countervailing evidence re that refutes the assumption behind the claim of deference, the response of critics is to double down on the claim of deference. It's to say, it's not to say, oh, I, I, I may have been mistaken, there, there may be more variance in the quality of executive action in the national security and, and foreign affairs domain than I previously thought. And therefore, we need to rethink the, the, the approach the courts take. The approach is to say, no, 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 the real risk here is not the people who are immediately falling under the spikes of executive action, the people whose rights are lost, the people whose families are torn apart. It's the threat to the executive itself, which I, I find a, a, a wonderfully perverse <laughs> and academic response. <laughs> The other thing that, that's kind of perverse in these discussions is that the theory of standing and lack of deference to the executive in these matters bar us directly from the opponents to actions that President Obama took, including DAPA, for example, right? And Texas's lawsuit uh, joined by 26 states against the administration for implementing DAPA. Opposition to the Trump administration simply borrowed a page from that uh, from that playbook. I find this very exciting uh, because I think that it reinvigorates a judiciary that has lost ground in the separation of powers in the Roberts and the Rehnquist era. So I'm glad to see a reinvigorated judiciary that's willing to accept standing and uh, and challenge claims of deference against the executive in these areas. Um, and uh, and you, I. I I hope that this will continue. So uh, we have about two minutes. Any closing thoughts? Anyone else to share? Um, I, I just wanted to say one thing about the, the Trump voters. And surely among them, these are the kinds of descriptions that, that you made. But um, I, I think Car Caroline was uh, getting to the, the I, I want to make. There are a lot of people in the United States of America for whom this economy is not working. You think to themselves, this is not working for me. And unfortunately, they saw Hillary Clinton not as a change maker, but as someone who was not going to bring about a better life for, for them, right or wrong. That's how, that's how they saw it. And they thought to themselves, I'm going to give this guy a chance um, and we're, we're willing, in many cases, I think, to overlook some of the embarrassing actions of this president because they felt, well, he'll just turn things upside down. But there is a point at which he has to deliver. And I think the example you gave of the health care betrayal, um, which people are, it, this is very personal. 
This is not like Russia. This is very personal. When 23 million Americans look at that and say, I think this is me. This is my family. This is my children. This is pre-existing conditions. When they see that, and I saw it in the budget hearing, that uh, you know that the, the, this administration argues that children don't need to be fed in school because there's no evidence that it helps them learn better. <laughs> when the Appalachian and the Delta, the Mississippi Delta economic development funds are cut from the, the, the Trump budget, these are the very people that he, he pledged to support. I think there is going to be a growing sense of betrayal, of a failure to deliver. Looking at the administration, populated by Goldman Sachs, by millionaires, no release of the his tax returns and, and the obvious conflicts of interest. I, I really do think that this has to build, but it is building. And we're helping, uh, there's a lot of activity to, to help push this uh, 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 along. So um, I, I think those conversations can happen with people who voted for, for Donald Trump. AARP, most people between 60, uh, between 50 and 64 voted for Donald Trump. 65 and older voted for Donald Trump. And now we see this pledge of nothing happening to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid being betrayed, and the AARP speaking to its 38 million members about how you didn't vote for this. I think those things are going to gain more and more traction as their lives get worse and not better. So I have to tell you about two more things. Um, you should plan to come to the ACF Chicago Learn Chapter. Uh, they have tons of great programming this summer, but in particular, the uh, annual Legal Legends Luncheon on June 19th. We'll be honoring a luminaries of the Chicago legal profession, including Carolyn Shapiro. Um, MC as always, and Tina Chen will be the keynote speaker. And mark your calendar now, um, October 19th to 21st. We're doing our first ever ACS National Lawyer Chapters convening in Milwaukee. Because where else do you want to be October 19th to 21st from Milwaukee? You can have on Amtrak. It's going to be great. Um, and we can on workshops and the chance to meet lawyers for Cosmic Country. So thanks for coming today, and please join me in thanking our panel.